first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out. What a beautiful morning to be uh, sitting under uh, these beautiful canopies uh, that are producing electricity as we speak with no CO2 output, so that's, that's great news. I want to thank all the members of Vineyard Power for coming out uh, and joining us and for supporting us for the last uh, two and a half years uh, that we've been a cooperative. We now have well, approaching uh, 1,300 members, which is quite an achievement. Here's Senator Wolf coming in now. Hello. 1,300 members um, and growing. So uh, one of the interesting things is as these canopies were going up, there was a lot of interest in the community that was uh, reinvigorating. We had a lot of members uh, joining over the last few months. This summer has been a great summer for us. Um, so I thought I'd take a little time to just explain a little bit about Vineyard Power and then say a few thank yous to the people who helped pull this project together. Uh, and I'll ask for some help along the way. Um, Vineyard Power started in November 2009, and it was really a response to two, two initiatives that had been going on. The first one was um, the Island Plan, and um, show it around in case people remember the Island Plan. It was a, a planning document that was commissioned by the Martha's Vineyard Commission uh, that was trying to look at what this island would look like in 50 years. And, for us as a community to take ownership and try to influence that outcome rather than the opposite. Um, it was a great piece of work. Uh, it dealt with things like population growth, uh, the natural habitat, uh, the watershed of Martha's Vineyard, and there was also a subgroup that dealt with energy and waste. And its theme was uh, increasing energy and waste autonomy for the island. Uh, when you think about it, all our energy is coming over uh, underground cables and fuel coming over on, uh, into the fuel terminals in Vineyard Haven, and all of our waste that we generate is also going equally back off on both. So um, they made 35 recommendations in that uh, subgroup, uh, and one of the top recommendations was for the island to get together and form a renewable energy cooperative that was owned by the community. So cooperative, owned by the members, and as I said, we have 1,300 members right now and growing. Um, the one great thing about local, uh, well, the one great thing about renewable energy is it can be produced locally, and the jobs can be kept here, and the money can be kept here. The second uh, external event that was going on was in early 2009, the federal government was making it quite clear that they were going to lease the federal waters off of Martha's Vineyard, similar to how the Cape Wind project was leased, but they wanted to try to improve on that project, since that one was pretty much a learn-as-they-go exercise. They formed a federal task force, which is made up of representatives, elected representatives from the region. And um, I'd like to say it's elected local um, officials. So every town has a selectman that sits on this federal task force. If you don't know that, you should, and you should know who your representative is on that task force. Uh, there are state officials um, from State Senator Wolf's office, Representative Madden's office. Um, tribal governments partake, and other federal agencies that are impacted by this, um, whether it's you know, Fisheries and Wildlife Services or the Department of Defense when it comes to unexploded ordinances that may be out in the ocean. So they started this initiative to start to lease the federal water. So we had two things going on, a master planning document which was calling for us to take control of our energy future, and externally the federal government about to lease uh, the water. So. So in 2009, sitting around Kate Warner's kitchen, I can remember sitting around Kate Warner's kitchen, uh, who was the founder of the Vineyard Energy Project, and we were sitting around discussing what should Vineyard Energy Project do. The outcome of those discussions was to take the initiative and form that cooperative that the Island Plan had called for, and that's how Vineyard Power came to be. Um, so over the last few years, the federal government has been moving forward on, on the leasing of the offshore ocean around us, Federal water starts at three miles out. So in theory, an offshore wind farm in federal waters could be three miles offshore. The federal task force was pulled together. There's been a lot of um, discussions. In fact, the federal government has held 30 stakeholder meetings in this area, many of them on Martha's Vineyard. They've held over eight task force meetings with these elected officials that I mentioned to you. And through a, a kind of iterative, iterative process and an open transparent process, they've agreed to move the wind area that they will lease from three miles to <laughs> nine miles to now 12 miles offshore and that's 12 nautical miles so it's approximately 14 miles off the south shore 
They've, they've also reduced the area that they're going to lease. They've reduced it by about half. And that's been done by deal, uh, discussing with other stakeholders, including fishermen, commercial fishermen specifically, and also with uh, wildlife and environmentalists. And they've reduced that. For example, around Nantucket, they took a large part of that away because of the foraging duck population there. So it's been an ingoing, ongoing process. And I'm, I'm kind of going through this because we're about to enter a very, very important stage for the island of Martha's Vineyard. Uh, the federal government is about to end what they call phase one, which I've just described to you that's got, been going on for about three years, which they call planning and analysis. And they're about to enter into the second stage of the process, which is called leasing. So we are about to enter into a point where they will be awarding leases and that, that will probably be occurring in the next year to two years. So um, if you haven't been interested in this subject before, or only moderately interested in this subject before, now is the time to get engaged because they will be issuing leases to applicants. Um, early in the process, they, uh, they asked for people who, and, and corporations who would be interested in developing. There was over 10 companies that had shown an interest in the water off Martha's Vineyard. They're all multinational companies. Some of them are from overseas, some of them from America. Some have built offshore wind farms before, some haven't. Vineyard Power, back in that time, we expressed an interest in three lease blocks. Our members at that time, wasn't a, wasn't a 1,300, it was a little less than 1,000, were engaged in a process in which we chose three lease blocks that Vineyard Power wished to develop an offshore wind farm. So um, we've done that. We're going to participate in the next round. Um, the next round is, is going to be critical because what we're now advocating for and what we should all try to advocate with our local officials for is we want the federal government to recognize that there should be some benefit for a local community-owned co-op to compete against the big purse strings of uh, the corporations I mentioned to you earlier. We're only looking for 10 to 20 turbines out of 1,000 that will probably be built out of there in the next 30 years. That 10 to 20 turbines is enough to power 75% of the island's power. We would own it, we would consume it, and we would really take control of our energy future and do a, do a big thing um, consistent with the old adage of thinking locally, of thinking globally, excuse me, and acting locally. Uh, and that's what's really at the heart of what Vineyard Power is all about. So um, now is a call to action. If anyone wants to get involved or learn more about the process, please come see Vineyard Power on our Facebook page, our website. Please consider joining this, this cooperative. All of the support is needed. One thing that the federal government does listen to and elected officials listen to is a group of 1,000, 1,500, and hopefully 3,000 and 4,000 members. So please get involved now. Um, so thanks for letting me talk a little bit about Vineyard Power and Wind, um, but we happen to be sitting under these beautiful uh, solar panels and not under wind turbines. So why are we doing solar? Well, first, solar, it's a renewable energy, and it's something our organization can implement and learn from as we grow to the wind farm. Our small wind farm that I described is a 200, initially a $200 million project, which would be uh, quite a task for any organization, let alone one that just started up uh, originally with volunteers, and now we have a few paid staff. But that's a, a fairly monumental or as I say, Herculean task. The solar project enable us as an organization to do these projects, renewable energy, get it out in the community. They're manageable. These projects here are about a million dollars that you're looking at right now. All of the same financial and business models that we're employing here are gonna be the same models we employ for the large wind projects. And how those models work is private investors who care about this and want to make socially conscious investments and really make an impact in their local community, invest in these projects. They will invest and make a return, a modest financial return, create local jobs in the process, increase our renewable energy production, and after a certain period of time, something around 10 years, they've achieved their financial um, objectives and the ownership flips. It flips to the cooperative, so it's a way to transfer ownership from the private sector into a community-owned cooperative. And also at the same time, the host of these systems 
has a chance to also purchase the system. If they don't exercise it, the cooperative would keep that system and run it on behalf of the cooperative. Um, so that's why we're doing the solar. They're, they're, they're visible, people see them. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of people joining up now because these projects are going on. So if you're also interested in seeing more of these solar projects around, please come and consider joining Vineyard Power. Um, so that's why we've done solar. That's what we're all about as far as Vineyard Power. Um, I'd like to say a, a few thank, thank yous and, and, and introduce a few people to come up here and speak. The first is uh, a real big thank you to uh, Mr. Steve Bernier. So if I can ask Steve to come up uh, and thank him. This, this man, as many of you uh, know, or many of you will get to know, is just a fantastic community-minded, visionary, and very, very generous supporter of a lot of these great initiatives I've been mentioning, and a lot of other great initiatives around the island. Um, he was there from the beginning, and without his courage to take this project on, we wouldn't be here, because this was a very courageous thing for someone to do. It's the first project on the island. When you stick your head up, you know, you're going to take shots, being the first one. He also took a risk about how this would look. He only had a chance to look at some images. So I want to thank him and, and have him say a few words to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. As I'm listening to Richard speak, our paradigms that we've grown up with need to shift a little bit to move into the new game. So as I'm listening to Richard speak, all of a sudden, we're embracing a utility. I grew up on a planet, you don't embrace the utility, you get <laughs> used by it. So to take the shift on and get with this, and then to say, well, how do we make this a community project? Well, I don't have anything about against people coming over on the boat and working here, but working with the gang at South Mountain Company, working with this property here, Kronigs, which is a community institution, with this new thing, Vineyard Power, and embracing a utility now, and thinking ahead 20, 30 years, God, did this make sense. So in that spirit, I think is where we got to the table, we sat down, we shared some turf, we started to partner, and we started to do community. Not Republican, not Democratic stuff. We started to do community. So we started to take care of our nation. So I, I would, this sounds weird, but I, I honestly believe this, that people going forward doing these solar arrays, please do it. What I ask you is to consider Vineyard Power in the equation because we will love having a utility company that's a co-op of this island, representing this island. 30 years from now, you will die for this opportunity to be alive and well. So if we're going to be visionaries, we've got to look further down the road and then come back and think about how do we plug in. So we have beautiful institutions on this island. Uh, we have a hospital, we have that high school parking lot, we have the park and ride. There's all kinds of opportunities and it would be nice to take this team and start replicating this. And let's introduce more electric cars. To watch people drive up and plug in and go in shopping. You know, no fossil fuel. Anybody gonna shoot me? <laughs> uh, you know, and so forth. So, I think we're here and it's beautiful to go back to that meeting with these guys and sitting there and wondering what am I getting myself into. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Um, so a few other thank yous, uh, if you allow me to indulge. Um, I'd like to first of all identify and thank the boards of directors of Indian Power. These are nine uh, members of our community, some year-round residents, some seasonal residents that have stepped up. They've run for election. They've been voted on the board by the members. Every year we have an election. Um, and I'd like to just point out the, you know, these uh, just very generous, unselfish uh, members of the community. I got, first of all, Paul Pimentel, who's the chairman of the board and one of the founding members of the cooperative. Uh, Ted Bain, who's not here. He's enjoying some time away. Bill Lake, uh, a resident of Aquina, a seasonal resident of Aquina. Mr. Ron D'Agostino, who's helped us with all our financial modeling and, uh, and helped me out along the way. Janet Orose is here. I saw her. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Dan Seidman, uh, Warren Doty, Rosalie Kerr, who uh, teaches at the Dartmouth College up in New Hampshire. 
and the new, uh, new, newest direct, director, Rex Gerald. I'd also like to acknowledge Susie Wasserman, a past director, Sue Ruby, David Damroth, and uh, from where it all began, Kate Warner, who I, I'd really like to say without her around, we, we probably wouldn't be here. So Kate, big thank you to Kate. Um, we're blessed to have a, a set of great advisors that join us, Sharon Strimling, Nick Catt, uh, Gino Mazzaffaro, to name a few, and Alan Willens. Um, there were investors in these projects. I mentioned earlier these projects were financed by private investors. We'd like to thank them, uh, and especially Julian Lee Moncton. We'd like to get a, a, a big thank you to those. They've been very, very helpful to us. The Edgartown National Bank, and it's the, the whole bank, uh, all of the staff, the tellers, um, and I'd like to particularly thank Mr. Paul Watts, because when we walked in his office over a year ago and asked that we would like to borrow some money, he didn't kick us out when we told him we'd like to borrow to build a solar canopy project over, over a parking lot. He actually listened to us and we worked together and, and really grew. So a really big thank you for Paul for taking that, that risk on. Thank you, Paul. Um, the Vineyard Power staff, I know a lot of you have met Eric. Uh, and uh, Eric is right over here. Kerry Downing and uh, uh, Teza Veracruza. So thank you so much, Kerry. Um, and uh, a pic particular like to thank Paul Pimentel and Barry for bringing their two electric uh, vehicles down here that we're going to charge. Um, but about a year ago, after us realizing that we were going to build solar, we put out an RFP, a request for proposal. It was a competitive uh, bid process. And out of that process, which lasted about six months, uh, we chose South Mountain a Company as our partner to develop these projects. It felt like a natural fit. Um, as many of you may be aware, South Mountain just celebrated its 25-year anniversary as an employee-owned company on the island, and I think that's just a, just a fantastic uh, achievement. So there was a, just a nice uh, coming together of values between our cooperative and South Mountain, and as you can see, the quality of the work has just been phenomenal. Um, so on behalf of everyone at Vineyard Power, we'd like to thank South Mountain, and I'd like to ask John Abrams to come up and say a few words about the people that helped them out. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Rich, I think what we're really celebrating today is um, the tendency, our tendency here on the vineyard to think global and act local. You know, that's <laughs> us. <laughs> and that definitely characterizes our partner in crime here. Um, for a couple of years, I've had a low-grade obsession with um, solar and parking lots. And I want to talk for a couple of moments about parking lots. But first, I just want to say how much we have loved doing this project, working with these partners. And I want to thank uh, Steve and Vineyard Power for being such great partners. And for us, it's really a thrill, a worker-owned cooperative business and a local business working with a consumer-owned cooperative and another local business. There's some poetry in that, and um, we're very excited about the next canopy that's going to go out in the other parking lot this fall. Before I talk about parking lots, um, aside from thanking them, I want to thank my colleagues at South Mountain, Rob Myers, Daryl Bazzi, Billy Dillon, a, a, and a number of others who have all contributed this, and our primary subcontractors, Bob Perry and his team, uh, Keith Fenner and his, Paul Simmons and his group, uh, Kent Healy, Chris Alley, a lot of people were involved in this. And I want to recognize Lawrence Mackler, who's somewhere around here. He is the founder and CEO of Solaire, the company that designed and fabricated the canopy structure, and also SunPower, the American manufacturer of what are the most efficient panels in the world. So, thanks to all of you. For a long time, this parking lot has really served three purposes. One, the temporary storage of automobiles. Two, a place for conversations. And three, a place for Steve to practice on a daily basis his skills with a broom and a dustpan. <laughs> <laughs> he does it very, very well. Now, it does four more things. It provides shade for us and our cars. It provides protection from the weather when we're unloading our groceries. It provides these wonderful electric charging stations for what will ultimately be a fleet of vehicles on the vineyard. And by the way, the slow if you plug in here, the slower you shop, the more <laughs> juice you get. I'm sorry, Steve, but I had to say it. Um, 
Um, but most importantly, it's um, the using this what is really distressed and free real estate to generate renewable fossil free fossil fuel free electricity. Um, this is an astonishing thing. In the U.S., there are roughly 4,000 square miles of parking lot. That's the size of a small state. And if they were all covered with these panels, we would be generating roughly half of the electricity we use in the U.S. today. So one of the things that was great about Vineyard Power and Steve is that when they sat down, when they signed on to this project, they said, we're not doing it unless it's economical and replicable and that we can do more. And it is, and there will be more, and wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to think about the Steamship Authority standby line in Woods Hole, Vineyard Haven, how many times have we sat and baked in the sun while we're waiting for our boat, the airport parking lot where um, you get back to your car and the steering wheel's hot enough to burn your fingers. These places can be covered, the Y, the high school, and so on. Um, we're hoping that we will keep going with this and do more. This really is the future and it's a great investment in tomorrow with a reasonable return today. This is good business. It's good for the planet. Thanks to all of you for sharing this moment. Thanks. Sir. Uh, just a few more thank, thank yous. Um, the Tisbury Board of Selectmen, Tisbury Planning Board, Ken Barwick, uh, the town of Tisbury, the Malthus Vineyard Commission, not only with the inspiration of the island plan, but also uh, they were one of the approval uh, bodies for this array. Um, and I'd like to uh, now get to introducing Senator, State Senator Dan Wolf, who's here. Um, come up and join me. Um, Senator Wolf has uh, had a lifelong uh, love of the Cape and the region, Cape and the Islands, coming up here when he was a young lad. Um, and after graduating college, he returned here and followed two of his passions, which was uh, flying planes and everything to do with aviation and living in this great, great place. Um, founder of Cape Air, 1988, is that? Yeah. 88 an founder. Employee. And which also became an employee yes, old yeah. company, which you see, there's a running theme here. Um, but that's another, another fantastic move. And also a, a company that's also focused on uh, green and energy efficiency initiatives, and I don't know if it's still the largest solar array in the, in the Cape? There, there's one larger array. Right okay, now. but it was at the time, Cape Air built uh, the largest solar array uh, in the region at the time, and it's still one of the largest, so uh, they, they put their money and their, and their values, their heart where their values are, so it's great to see uh, Senator Wolf here. Senator Wolf's been a supporter of Vineyard Power all along for the obvious reasons, and I'd like to thank him and welcome here, and uh, Please uh, offer a round of support for uh, Senator Wolf. But before flying over here this morning, and unfortunately we don't have a solar powered plane yet, but um, I left our headquarters building in Hyannis, which is, it has a 248 uh, KW installation on the top, which virtually powers uh, the entire headquarters building for our airline. This array, uh, which is about the same size, uh, will offset the electricity used, I believe, by between 30 and 35 homes on a year-round basis. That's huge. 30 to 35 homes worth of electricity is being produced on an annual basis in this solar array. And one of the things that I'm comfortable saying here, but don't spread the word too far, is 35 years ago, I was very involved with an organization called the Clamshell Alliance. <laughs> and had a couple of great weeks courtesy of the governor then, Meldrum Thompson, up in, up in uh, New Hampshire, to actually think about the paradigm of energy production, distribution, and consumption. And really came to the conclusion that it is all about distributive, and also came to the conclusion that what you end up doing is a reflection of the business model that you use to do it. It's why certain people are committed to employee ownership, because they know that being committed to certain business values creates a behavior that is consistent with good community values. So when we talk about utilities that are public utilities, that are community-owned utilities, the reason we do that is because we know the outcome of a business that grows as a community-owned business is going to be consistent with all of the other values of that community environmental stewardship, good responsible financial management. I could go on and on. So this is a model, and I will tell you, 
I do serve the best state senate district in the United States. Yeah. 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 And this is the epicenter of it. It is so cool for me, it's energizing for me to be able to go up to the state house and say, here's a model of a community which has made a decision that power to the people actually is both literal and figurative. You know, when we were a kid, power to the people was, was a saying that was uh, used wide and far. I'm not sure they visioned that, you know, 30, 40 years after that, we would have taken it literally, but we are. And it is so energizing. Uh, Vineyard Power to have Steve to have you and your company uh, participate and show the leadership. Uh, I am fully committed, hopefully I won't be committed, but fully committed <laughs> to see good regional models of ownership that will then responsibly develop the production, distribution, and use of energy. It, it's where we begin because that model then transfers to food production, it transfers to financial services, and we stop listening to the political banter that we are tired of actually listening to and start to listen to the voices in the community that actually are having the right conversation now. It is so refreshing for me as a politician to be able to come here and have my compass reset and continue to be steered in the right direction knowing that the conversations that are happening here are the ones that actually show us and lead us to a bright future out there for our kids and for our grandchildren. All of the kids who are going shopping with their parents here and get out of the car and walk in under this solar array, that's their new normal. That's their expectation. That's the world that they're growing up in. And you know, ExxonMobil with their $60 billion and all the fracking in the world is not going to change that. It is not going to change that. So. Uh, again, for me to be here as part of this, uh, it is a real honor and a pleasure, not only to serve you in general, to, but to be asked to be uh, here as part of this, because I think energy production is the most visible, visceral model of how communities determine, chart, live their own destiny, of any that are out there. So that this not only is great here and now <coughs> for this, but it's great for the future and it's great for all of the other sectors of, of community involvement that we're looking for. So thank you. Thank you. And you know, we're going to make this utility uh, own all of the power on Martha's Vineyard because it's a great model. Thank yeah. you so much, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, as John uh, mentioned, uh, we're about to commission the next canopy that's going to go up in the front of the parking lot. So all after Labor Day, all throughout the fall and into the early winter, you're going to see us building the next canopy. Uh, by the time we're finished, it's going to be a 210 kW uh, facility. It's going to produce enough of uh, uh, energy to supply over 35% of Tony's demand. And as uh, Senator Wolf said, a lot of homes on the vineyard. So we're looking forward to that. We've already started our next project, which is um, uh, to put, uh, build a, um, a PV solar array on top of the capped landfill in the town of Aquina. Adam Wilson is here from the town and we'd like to just say that's a project we're looking forward to and we're hoping to do more of those. And we've also gotten enough financing to do two additional projects, which is also great news. So we're, we're very busy. People are supporting us and, and thank you all for doing that. I'd like to ask Paul Pimentel to come up here and Senator Wolf and they're going to have the privilege. Paul's going to talk a little bit about these vehicles and then they're going to have the privilege of plugging in these two great electric cars behind us. Uh, and. Uh, and, and really flipping the switch or kicking off the uh, the solar array. So Paul, come on up with Senator Wolf, and thanks a lot. Um, yeah. This is my car over here. My wife and my my car uh, is 100 percent electric. There are no engines. There's no oil. There's no transmission. There's no uh, exhaust system. There's no a lot of things that you think of when you think car maintenance. Um, its range on the island uh, is 125 miles. Uh, which means I can go for three days without charging it. It takes about seven hours to fully charge it. Uh, on top of all of that, this car and electricity over gasoline that the prices we pay saves about $4,500 every over a seven year period. So I get my money back in terms of the extra cost of the car easily within the time I own it. And during that time, uh, we're also avoiding 50 tons of carbon dioxide emissions into our atmosphere. So it's very quiet. It's, it saves our environment, it saves you money, and it's a fun. 
Thank you, drive. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to do the honors? Uh, let's let's, let's, let's plug, plug, it plug in the cars. Plug it in. Well, you can all come around and watch them do <laughs> it if you're interested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> And uh, it takes about seven hours or so to charge. Uh, I plug it in at night usually, but the next morning it's uh, more than fully charged. We, we have a delivery vehicle on Nantucket, which is an electric vehicle. And as part of that, and I think this is, I'm sure, a dialogue you're having here, that we don't want to bring electric vehicles unless we're also producing the offset in renewable. Because otherwise all you're doing is you're making it someone else's coal problem. So when we put our car on Nantucket, we actually are building a solar array on the high school that will offset the energy used in the car. Um, I'm looking, I, I shouldn't say I'm looking forward to having a bag delivery car out here that's all electric because that's sort of the cynical concession, but uh, the vineyard is the next place that we'll be putting an all electric vehicle. It's nice to know we'll be able to charge it here. <laughs> part of, the, uh, part of the, the island plan and part of the basis for our, our wind turbine uh, wind farm is that we're going to convert half the cars on the island by 2050 to electric. Um, if we convert half our cars to electric, we will collectively save four and a half million dollars a year and we will uh, reduce our carbon output by 44,000 tons per year or about 12 percent of what we currently emit. And, and electric cars on this island make great sense. They make sense on, on Nantucket too, maybe even more sense. <laughs> but they work beautifully here. So in, uh, so in closing, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, there's a uh, fundraiser for Senator Wolf on the island next Monday, if anybody's interested in supporting the senator. Uh, it's at Dan Wartman's house. And it's in what town is in Dan, Dan's house? In? Vineyard Haven, Heinz Point. So come out and support the senator. It'd be great to support him in his re-election campaign. Yeah. Um, and if anyone's interested in that, you can please come and ask over here. Um, and if Dr. Mazur would like to come up and say anything about his BMW, we'd also like to <laughs> offer a chance for him to do that as well. Well, it's very similar to the leaf, but uh, I go a little faster. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and I charge in three and a half hours. Uh, for a full charge to 100%, and I get roughly 110 miles to a charge. And essentially, um, this car will uh, 110 miles for four dollars and fifty cents. That's how much per kilowatt. So it's amazing, and uh, BMW is coming out with a uh, a completely electric car. This is completely electric. This is a prototype. And all the running gear is being tested in this prototype. And the BMW will be coming out with an i3. And it will have a motor that recharges the batteries. And will have a 200 mile range. He likes a ball. I get about 15 miles of range for a BMW. For, for, for a couple of more miles per hour. And it, it is incredibly quick, especially when you have bicyclers and scooters. There is no waiting for power. It is there instantly. It's fantastic on this island. Amazing. And it'll charge at 120, 240, and very shortly they'll have what they call level 3 charging, which will take a half an hour or 400 miles. So it's all in the future.